Amen. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Great singing, you may be seated. Welcome to Trinity on Wednesday nights. We got people all over the building learning and growing and we're excited about what God's doing around here. You know in the last couple of weeks we've doubled on Wednesday nights. Did you know that? It's been amazing. We averaged 80 the last, uh, the last year or so uh, on Wednesday nights and the last two weeks we've had 150 and 171. So praise the Lord for that and I hope you've been getting a lot out of the series we've been doing and I know that we've had a lot of people growing in discipleship groups and the kids are having fun and the learning and the teens, so we're, we're just excited about that. If you didn't get, there's two things we should have got when you came in. One was a handout for tonight's lesson, so it's a big handout that has Christ's return right on the top. If you didn't get one of those, I got a couple of distinguished gentlemen here that are willing to hand some out for you. The second thing you should have got is also a Wednesday night prayer list, and I know Dave is going to be excited to know that I got mine already. He's given me his the last two weeks, so <clears throat> we're really glad that we had that. We're going to do the prayer list at the end. There's also back at the back on those um, music stands, and you will not offend me by going back there, there are prayer request slips that if you have a prayer request you'd like for us to pray about tonight, um, you can grab those. If you're on watching us online, you can go to our website, and there's a prayer tab, and on that prayer tab you can fill in a prayer request, and we'll get those, and we'll add those to the prayer list. And so... Uh, we'll be going over those at the end of the uh, service tonight. We'll cut off um, the live stream, so it's just the prayer requests are just about who's in the room. And, uh, but, of course, if you have a prayer request, we'd love to pray for you if you're online, so make sure you fill out that form on trinitybaptistfinley.com. So we're on, the, we're on the World Wide Web. The Internet cord got to our building, so we're connected. And That's a joke. It's dumb. I, anyway, um, We're going to get into today's um, lesson. Matthew chapter 24 is where we're going to be tonight. Matthew chapter 24. So if you have your Bibles, go in them to Matthew chapter 24. Um, We have established a couple of things over the last couple of weeks. And to get us um, into tonight's uh, text, let's do this. Let's read... And we're going to read up until, go to Matthew chapter 24. We're going to read, starting in verse 1. And I'm going to read down, um, let's see, to verse number 9. That's where we'll get through tonight. We, I won't cover everything I possibly can with those nine verses, but we'll start there. So let's look at Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 9. Let's go there, okay? Here's what it says. And Jesus went out departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another, and that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, what shall these, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world. So let's pause for a second. I'll keep reading here in a moment. The context here, Jesus has been from the triumphal entry into the temple. He overthrew the money changers. He went back the next day, pronounced woe on the Pharisees, and then talked about the temple and what was going on there. They asked him if he was the Messiah. All these different things were going on. Eventually, um, as he's leaving the temple, he tells his disciples as he's leaving Jerusalem, leaving the temple, hey, you see all these things, not one stone will be left upon another. This whole uh, temple is going to be overthrown. Um, And so in the disciples' mind, this is what we covered two weeks ago and then uh, last week, in the disciples' mind, Jesus didn't have two comings. Jesus, they, the disciples believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that as they followed him. And you would too, if you saw him transfigured and calm the storm and 
do all those other things. So they believe Jesus is the Messiah. They, but they believe because of their theology, because they only had the Old Testament, they believe that Jesus had one coming, not two. So they believe that, and, and now he's rode in on a donkey. That's fulfilling um, prophecy. He is saying to the public that he's the Messiah by what he did. Um, they are excited because that means, he, that means in their mind the kingdom is coming and it's coming now. It's coming quick. We want it to happen. And, and they believe that um, the second coming, there, there would be uh, all kinds of things that would go on, uh, all kinds of devastation, apocalypse, but that Jesus, when he comes back, he's going to bring in the kingdom, defeat the nations. And so they were excited, even at the, in and around the Last Supper, supper they were discussing, well, who would be the greatest in the kingdom? Who's going to sit on his right hand and on his left? They're, they're bl- believing all those things. And so they're, they're at a situation now. Jesus is talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and, and all these things happening. And they're thinking, that's why they ask what they ask in verse number two, or sorry, verse number three. Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? That's what I covered the first week. In the second week, I went to, I went to verse number eight specifically, where it says, and all these things are the beginning of sorrows. We'll talk about that in a minute. I'm going to read, continuing where we were at, and I want you to see how many times it says the end is not yet. Okay? Verse 4. So they're asking, what's the end of the age? What's the sign of your coming? How do we, and coming there meaning full fruition, how do we know when you're going to be king and we're going to rule and reign with you, when is this going to happen? What are the signs? Verse 4. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is, do you see it? Not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. I'll keep reading. And, and then shall many, many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false, false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he shall then endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then the end shall come. I believe that this part of Matthew chapter 24, this answer that Jesus gives, we talked about how all of this is talking about future. Here he talks about birth pains. The name of this particular sermon I'm going to preach to you is called birth pains because birth pains, and I talked about this last week, help us understand that this is something that is going to happen at the end. When, when there's a pregnancy, who here has been around someone with a pregnancy? Do birth pains happen at the beginning or do they happen at the end? Pregnancy pains happen kind of throughout. Husbands give sympathy weight to their wives. Did anybody have that happen? When my wife was eating more, I was eating more. It was great, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? This, okay, I'm the only one? Okay, got it. Birth pains happen at the end. How do birth pains happen? They start less intense to more intense or more intense to less intense? Less to more. Are they further between each other to closer to between each other or closer than further? Right, it starts out further from each other and gets closer. It starts out less intense and gets more intense. These are what we call birth pains, right? That's exactly what he's saying is going to happen at the end. It is my belief that Matthew chapter 24 is, is in terms of end times prophecy, is after the tribulation, uh, sorry, after, not the tribulation, I almost 
got kicked out here. After the rapture, the church will not be a part of it. But before Jesus' second coming, what he's describing is the tribulation. The seven years of tribulation between when the church is taken up and when Jesus Christ comes back a second time. That's what's being described here. You say, well, what do you mean? How do you know that? Well, there's a lot of reasons that I've covered the last two weeks. If you haven't seen them, go on to our website and check out what we've talked about so far. But I want to show you something really interesting. If you have your Bibles, I need you. In fact, I'm going to ask Brother Gentry to come up here. Brother Gentry, would you help me for a second? Can I use the lead mic? Is that an okay one to use? Okay. Brother Gentry, you're in Matthew 24? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'm going to have you read. You want to do that or do you want to do Revelation? I'm going to let you go, go to Revelation. Go to Revelation. And you're going to go to Revelation chapter number 6, I believe, which is, yeah, Revelation chapter number 6. Okay? And this is obviously during the tribulation, which we can talk about, we'll talk about a little bit. But I'm gonna, we're going to start walking through. These are the seal judgments. Now, a seal, there, in, in the book of Revelation, at least three of them, there's seals, then there's trumpets, then there's vials or bowls. Those are three different series of judgments that happen during the tribulation. Okay. Now, Jesus describes in Matthew 24 these birth pains, and we're going to read the, about these seals. Okay. So... Brother Gentry, in verse number one, it gives us the first, uh, verse one and, yeah, verse one and two gives us the first two seals. Would you read, read verse one? And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. Okay, go ahead and read verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering to conquer. So you have this rider on a white horse, and you have war happening from this rider. Do you see it? Okay, now go back to Matthew chapter 24, which is our text. You can kind of do both. You have like, we're going back and forth, okay? Matthew 24, Jesus says in chapter 4, in verse 4, And take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. You have the first birth pain, and I'm giving these to you quick early, okay? Tonight we're going to talk about four of at least the six that we're going to talk about. But the first one is false messiahs, false teachers that are deceiving people at the end of the age. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about all these in detail. Who is the epitome in the tribulation of the false teachers? There's lots of them, but who's the epitome of false teachers in the end times? Does anybody know? There's the false prophet, but there's also the antichrist right in verse number one for many shall come in my name saying i am what christ and he shall deceive many so you have this person that's coming among many who are deceiving and he's the number one deceiving and we're going to see as we're going to study in a minute he is used to make war with the nations. A bunch of the war that goes on happens because he's going to war with all over the place. We're going to see that. So seal number one is this person that's going to conquer. Seal number two is the fact that he's conquering, right? The second says, verse three, and when he opened the second seal, go ahead and read. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast saying, come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. So 
The first seal is this person going forth to conquer, the Antichrist. Also a deceiver in Matthew 24. The second one is this sword that's given and this power that they should kill, go out and kill one another. And there was this great sword. So what do we see in verse 6? And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See thee, be not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And the nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. So here you have worldwide war. First one's a deceive, the deceivers, false messiah. Second one is worldwide war. Wars of all kinds, right? Seal number th- three, verse five. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts saying, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. In verse 5, you see um, this, this third seal. It's a black horse with a pair of balances in his hands. What's used in those balances is like what they would use to measure out money for food. And then you have in verse 6, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of uh, barley for a penny and see that it hurt not the oil and wine. That's talking about famine. The prices here are inflated because there's so little food. So just a tiny little bit for a day's wage, just a tiny little bit. Um, that's what it's talking about. So you're talking about Famine. Okay, go back to Matthew 24. Verse 7 said, Wars and rumors of wars, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. So do you see how the seal judgments are coordinating with what, exactly what Jesus said would happen? You're like, well, prove one more. Okay, let's look at one more. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Verse, um, verse number... Nine, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Okay. Verse number eight in Revelation six. Or sorry, verse number seven. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his, na- and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. I got a little ahead of myself. There's talking about death with hunger, pestilences, those kinds of things. That's, again, coordinating with Matthew chapter 24, verses, verse 7. At the end, there shall be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in diverse places. Verse 9, then, get, then when we get to verse 9 of Revelation chapter 6, go ahead and read that. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So and here in verse 9, you have people who are being slain who, for what reason? For the word of God. Mm-hmm. Are you with me? Okay, now go to Matthew 24. And look at what Jesus says next in verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Do you see any kind of correlation here? What Jesus is saying about the end times, here's the thing. He's the author of the book. He's author of both. Are you with me? So I believe, not, not, not all of the seals completely coordinate, but it definitely seems like, Similar authors. Who agrees? Okay. You see the point. You see my connection. Give it up for Vanna White. Thank you, Vanna. You guys, I appreciate it. All right. So I'm making the argument that this is about the tribulation. And we're going to talk tonight about these first four of the birth pains. We're going to go on and do um, more next week. So let's talk about these birth pains. You have it on your handout Here's my uh, sermon in a sentence. We can understand the beginning of the tribulation. That's why I use the word tribulation. Because I believe this birth pains are talking about the first part of the tribulation. Then it's going to talk about the abomination of desolations, which is in the middle. And then it's going to talk about the the end, the last three and a half years, 
uh, later on in Matthew 24 and 25. So we can understand the beginning of the tribulation by understanding the six birth pains described in Matthew 24, and we're going to go through verse 9. I put 1 through 10, but we're going to go through verse 9. The first birth pain, you've already heard it, right? Number one are false teachers or false messiahs. False messiahs. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my, my name, saying, I am Christ, and he shall, and shall deceive many. Now, pause for a second. One reason why so many people get this interpreted wrong is because they miss something that Jesus does that is, I've already brought this up, but I'm bringing it up again because there may be some new people here. When a prophet talked about end times or talked about a future event, sometimes he used present tense or talked to the people that were in front of him, in front of him as if they would be in that future time. That's all over the Old Testament. Isaiah talking about something that would happen 200 years later, but speaking to the people that were right in front of him. Do you, does that make sense? These guys did not know when Jesus would come. They didn't even know that Jesus was going to come back or return. They, they didn't understand that that was... They did not see... They did not see the, the time between Jesus... They didn't even hardly see Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. They, they didn't see... It. He kept saying, I'm going to die, I'm going to rise again. And they're like... It just went past them. What they thought was going to happen was that, when, especially once they started seeing Jesus come into the temple and doing all that he's doing, they're going, okay, when are you going to come into the full fruit, the, the, what it means to be Messiah and overthrow Rome and, and, and reign and rule on David's throne? We know about all this. When is this going to happen? Because they did not see the church age. That's why Paul, the apostle Paul, calls it the mystery. Behold, I show you a mystery. He's talking about He's talking about this thing that was previously not uh, addressed, okay? That, that, that um, in, we talked about that, remember? Just, let's go, Ephesians. Ephesians. We studied this just a few weeks ago in our series on Sunday morning. But now I, I showed it to you in terms of trying to give you the gospel sense of it. Now I want you to have it in the sense of the way they thought about eschatology and end times. Paul says in, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he had made known unto the, me the mystery, as I wrote a four in a few words, talking about chapter two, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So what was, what was the mystery that he's talking about? The mystery was where Jews and Gentiles were brought together in one body, and that salvation was not just for the Jews, it was for the Gentiles. Where, where are Jews and Gentiles who are saved in one body? Where are they at? That's called the church. They had no clue about the church and the church age. I'll prove it one more area. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I just want you to get this. This is so important. Acts chapter 1. Here's how much they didn't get it. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, and being assembled, Acts 1, 4, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye had heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. What is the context here? Jesus has been resurrected. He is about to ascend. He told him, I'm going. I need to go so that, so that the Holy Spirit can come on you. That's what he just said, right? Verse number six. When they were therefore come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? 
hey, that was a cool trick, Jesus. You died and rose again. Is the second coming now? They wouldn't have said second coming. They thought, okay, the coming. How's this going to happen? Jesus said, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put in his own power, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You'll be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. How many think that would be cool to see? Pretty amazing. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which, he, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So basically, they're like, he went up, and they're still standing there like, okay. Now? Right? Be my witnesses. Okay. What I'm saying is, they thought that second coming was, a, by that point, they would have thought, okay, it's going to be a lot closer. So my point is, they did not see the church age. So when Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, when he's saying to them, don't be deceived, and he's talking to his disciples, and he's giving them this, this answer, he's not necessarily, because he's saying you, and he's speaking to them, he's not necessarily saying that they would be the ones that endured it at the end. He's speaking, he's transported into the future because that's exactly what they were asking about. And he's speaking to them as if they're the ones that are going to be a part of that future. Does that make sense? Okay. So, he says, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, so this first birth pain is false messiahs. There are, um, you, some might say, well, there's always been false messiahs. That's true. But it seems to be the case here that there are going to be a, more and more people who are claiming to be false messiahs, false teachers. There are go, it's going to grow. He says here, take heed, which is the word blepo, to see to it or be aware. That's, what, that, that's the idea he's giving here. He's giving them a warning. When the, at the end times, when the Holy Spirit is gone, when the church is taken away, and it's the time of the tribulation, there's going to be all kinds of chaos. And in all of this chaos and all this catastrophe, people will be looking for answers. And there will be people that rise up during that time to say, hey, you can trust in me. You can, you can believe in me. Follow me. And they will try to take advantage at that time. There are going to be so many people deceived. The number one example, as I've already asked you, what was the number, what's the number one example of this in the end times? It's the Antichrist. This one who comes and is empowered by Satan, and he will be the ultimate example of false, these false Christs. The Antichrist is described in multiple ways throughout Scripture. In number one, he's described as a deceptive and a fierce king in Daniel chapter 8, 23. I didn't put all the scripture I'm going to go through tonight on the screen, so, uh, on the screen but I'm going to take you and read it. You can go with me. I'll give you the verses. But at the very least, write these verses down, and then you can go back and read them later, okay? Some of them I'll tell you when we're going to be there for a minute. Daniel eight twenty three through 25 is this first part that describes this deceptive and fierce king. It says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. Here you have this fierce king who understands dark sayings or dark sentences or understands um, he, he's a very deceptive uh, person. It says he'll stand up. His power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cut, cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. We understand that in the end the Antichrist is going to try to make peace and, and 
will sign peace treaties, and then he will break those peace treaties. Um, and, then, and then at the end, this is the, my favorite part, end of verse 25, but he shall be broken without hand. Who breaks the Antichrist? Jesus Christ himself. That's who does it. So he's a deceptive and a fierce king. He's also an arrogant and prideful king. On, in Daniel 11, verse 36 and 37, it says this, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that he is determined... For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall magnify himself above all. What an incredible description of this arrogant king. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. If you have that, 2 Thessalonians it describes him as the son of perdition. Perdition means what? Perdition is what? Sin. Perdition is sin, man of sin, son of perdition. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 says this, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, talking about the day of the Lord, we just studied this in Sunday school, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. When Satan fell, what was his sin? It was the sin of pride. He said, I'm going to make myself above God. Satan inhabits this Antichrist, and he does exactly the same thing, exalting himself as God. Revelation describes him this way. He re, they, they describe him as a beast, a beast. Revelation eleven seven talks about and when they sh have, shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. We're going to see this in a minute, but this is he is described as a as a beast, and so. I believe this is talking about end times because it's talking about these false messiahs and the, the main purveyor as false messiah is this anti-Christ. Here's birth pain number two. Are you ready? Birth pain number two. It is wars or wars and rumors of wars, as the scripture says. Look at verse six. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is... Not yet, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The, the phrase, and ye shall hear of wars, the, the Greek tense is in such a way that it's, it's like it's saying, you will just keep hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing about wars. Not just one, and obviously wars and rumors of wars, there's all kinds of wars. Cold wars, hot wars, Local wars, global wars, it will be a time of war. Has anybody, anybody ever, anybody in here, maybe this isn't the demographic for it, but anybody here ever go uh, paintballing? We got one. I am just a large, slow target. Oh, you've done it? I'm just a big, dumb, slow target. That's what I've just figured out about, about paintball. I took some... Um, teenagers when I was a youth pastor and instead of going to a paintball course where we lived in Port Charlotte there were all these woods wooded areas all around and uh, we had some guys that already had all the equipment we went out and bought a bunch of paintballs but paintball you understand what it is there's guns it usually goes through a co2 is what propels it and you put uh, the paintballs in a hopper and then you shoot each other and it's awesome um <laughs> But in Florida, I, don't, I was kind of a dumb youth pastor. It was Florida during the summer in the woods. We're all out there in the middle of nowhere running around in the woods. But I, I got this like feeling of actually being, I remember that being one of the first times where I just in my own mind thought about, this is what war is like, except that when I get hit, I laugh and, you know, start over. 
But can, I, it was that moment that I imagined, what would it be like where it's like you're one and done. Like you get one shot, and if you get shot, not only are you out of the game, you're out of life, <laughs> right? And imagining what war is like is just incredible. And then I thought, man, I'm glad we're, like, I'm glad that war today is with guns because back in the day it was with, like, dull knives. That would hurt more. Who agrees? Like, that would be bad. Okay. Here you have wars, and it says rumors of wars, every kind of war imaginable. Some say, well, you're like, well, Ben, this is already happening or has happened. Now, remember what's described, birth pains, right? And these birth pains, he's describing the first three and a half years of the tribulation, And he's saying those are like birth pains. Now, I believe that some of the things we're seeing in these things are happening pre- Who agrees there's more and more false messiahs, false teachers? Okay. Who agrees that the 20th century and now the 21st century has been a very bloody century in terms of World War I, World War II? I mean, there's been almost constant war. And you're like, well, that's human history. Yes, but it seems to be ramping up. Well, we have cable news. No, I think there's more. I think there's more going on. Now, this is talking about after the, after the rapture, but we see this coming up. Um, this will be to a degree that's not been seen. There will be a massive amount of bloodshed and carnage. And he says, these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He says, nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Some have asked, and I even thought, like, is this talking about, is this talking about two different ki- kinds of warfare or two different, ki- if anything, nations are maybe ones without kings, kingdoms are ones with kings. I think he's just saying that there's all kinds of conflict. Now, why do I say it? Well, because Daniel and Revelation give us some insight. If you look at Daniel chapter 11, Verse 40, this is talking, this is interesting. This may be where we end tonight. I'm going to only get through the first two, okay? Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. Everybody go there, because you'll be lost if we don't, okay? Daniel chapter 11, verse 40. When you study out Daniel, you'll find that the Antichrist seems to be the head of a, of a revived Roman Empire. Geographically, that seems to be in and around the Mediterranean. And so in Daniel 11, in verse 40, it says, And at the time of the end, so this is talking about tribulation, the king of the south shall push out him. Him there is talking about this Antichrist. The king of the south shall push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and uh, and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore shall he go forth with a great fury to destroy and utterly, and utterly to, take, to, make a, to, to take away many. So you have this Antichrist and he's being attacked from the south. He's being attacked from the north. He defeats all of them. He takes over parts of Africa. That's what's being talked about here. He's fought off the north. But then later, you have it happening where in tidings out of the east and north come back, trouble him. Some would say that may be Russia, that may be uh, China. Therefore, he shall go forth with a great fury to destroy and utterly uh, make away many. Verse 45, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious Holy Mountain, where is that, the glorious Holy Mountain? Jerusalem. This is exactly describing what's going to happen in Revelation. 
yet shall it come to his end, and none shall help him. You keep having this repeated thing that in the end, who's taking him out? Jesus has taken him out, right? If you go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, go ahead and just a couple pages um, different there. It says in Daniel 9, 27, talking about Israel, Israel is going to need protection. And so we talked about him making peace with some and all of that in the previous passages. Daniel 9, 27 says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even to the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate so here you have <coughs> him making peace treaties and then breaking and we, we know he's going to break him after three and a half years so in that passage and seeing in the uh, in Daniel 9 27 you see this Antichrist fighting with the north, the south, the east. They're all going against the Antichrist. He ends up winning, but then he's defeated. So you have, again, just all kinds of wars and rumors of wars. You got one more, and then we'll pray. Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14. Man, I can keep going. Fourteen one. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. This is the second coming. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. Isn't that awesome? Which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst of toward the east and towards the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall re remove toward the north and half of it towards the south. So, again, this is the Antichrist that at some point is going to uh, be in Jerusalem. The nations are going to come to Jerusalem, but when they come, they're going to fight, they're, but they're going to end up fighting, and they're going to end up fighting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and Jesus is going to come and is going to touch the Mount of Olives, and he's going to take them all out. My point is, this is a time of war. You guys see it? It's a time of war. Tribulation. Now, here's the good news. There's at least four or five more. We're going to get into them next week. But if you know Christ as your Savior, you're not going to be there. Who agrees? That's awesome. But he can come at any time. He can come at any time. We're talking about false messiahs. We're talking about wars and rumors of wars. The next couple of weeks, we'll talk about um, people being um, um, persecuted and martyred. Do you know that there's more persecution come, happening right now than just about any other time in history? There's people all over the world be, being killed for the gospel. We're going to talk about natural disasters, so-called natural disasters, pestilences. We're talking about persecution. It seems like things are ramping up. Jesus could come back in 100 years. He could come back tonight. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen? Let's pray and then we'll get into our prayer list tonight. God, we love you. Thank you for this time that we've had to look at your word. I pray that you'd help us to feel a sense of urgency about these things. There are people that we know that unless they get right with you, they may be a part of this. They may get to the place where they're deceived. They may get to the place where they're involved in all this chaos and this war. And I pray you'd help us to have an urgency. Help us to look with our eyes to heaven waiting for you to be here, but help our feet to move quickly to those who are lost. Help us to have an urgency about the gospel and help us to, as we do have an urgency about it, to say, even so, come, Lord Jesus. We love you. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
We're going to end our live stream now. Thanks for being with us on Facebook. And if you have a uh, prayer request, go to our